For what they are worth, I want to give my opinions about the life of a Paris plongeur. When one comes to think of it, it is strange that thousands of people in a great modern city should spend their waking hours swabbing dishes in hot dens underground. The question I am raising is why this life goes on, what purpose it serves, and who wants it to continue, and why. I am not taking the merely rebellious, feignant attitude. I am trying to consider the social significance of a plongeur's life. I think one should start by saying that a plongeur is one of the slaves of the modern world. Not that there is any need to whine over him, for he is better off than many manual workers, but still, he is no freer than if he were bought and sold. His work is servile and without art. He is paid just enough to keep him alive. His only holiday is the sack. He is cut off from marriage, or if he marries, his wife must work too. Except by a lucky chance, he has no escape from this life save into prison. At this moment, there are men with university degrees scrubbing dishes in Paris for 10 or 15 hours a day. One cannot say that it is mere idleness on their part for an idle man cannot be a plongeur. They have simply been trapped by a routine which makes thought impossible. If plongeurs thought at all, they would long ago have formed a union and gone on strike for better treatment. But they do not think, because they have no leisure for it. Their life has made slaves of them. The question is, why does this slavery continue? People have a way of taking it for granted that all work is done for a sound purpose. They see somebody else doing a disagreeable job, and they think that they have solved things by saying that the job is necessary. Coal mining, for example, is hard work, but it is necessary. We must have coal. Working in the sewers is unpleasant, but somebody must work in the sewers and similarly with a plongeur's work. Some people must feed in restaurants, and so other people must swab dishes for 80 hours a week. It is the work of civilization, therefore unquestionable. This point is worth considering. Is a plongeur's work really necessary to civilization? We have a feeling that it must be honest work, because it is hard and disagreeable, and we have made a sort of fetish of manual work. We see a man cutting down a tree, and we make sure that he is filling a social need just because he uses his muscles. It does not occur to us that he may only be cutting down a beautiful tree to make room for a hideous statue. I believe it is the same with a plongeur. He earns his bread in the sweat of his brow, but it does not follow that he is doing anything useful. He may only be supplying a luxury which, very often, is not a luxury. As an example of what I mean by luxuries which are not luxuries, take an extreme case, such as one hardly sees in Europe. Take an Indian rickshaw puller, or a gary pony. In any Far Eastern town, there are rickshaw pullers by the hundred, black wretches weighing eight stone, clad in loincloths. Some of them are diseased, some of them are fifty years old. For miles on end, they trot in the sun or rain, head down, dragging at the shafts, with the sweat dripping from their gray mustaches. When they go too slowly for the passenger, calls them a banishute. They earn thirty or forty rupees a month, and cough their lungs out after a few years. The Gary ponies are gaunt, vicious things that have been sold cheap as having a few years' work left in them. Their master looks on the whip as a substitute for food. Their work expresses itself in a sort of equation, 
Whip plus food equals energy. Generally, it is about 60% whip and 40% food. Sometimes their necks are encircled by one vast sore so that they drag all day on raw flesh. It is still possible to make them work, however. It is just a question of thrashing them so hard that the pain behind outweighs the pain in front. After a few years, even the whip loses its virtue, and the pony goes to the knacker. These are instances of unnecessary work, for there is no real need for garries and rickshaws. They only exist because Orientals consider it vulgar to walk. They are luxuries, and, as anyone who has ridden in them knows, very poor luxuries. They afford a small amount of convenience, which cannot possibly balance the suffering of the men and animals. Similarly with the plongeur. He is a king compared with a rickshaw puller or a gary pony, but his case is analogous. He is a slave of a hotel or restaurant, and his slavery is more or less useless. For, after all, where is the real need of big hotels and smart restaurants? They are supposed to provide luxury, but in reality, they provide only a cheap, shoddy imitation of it. Nearly everyone hates hotels. Some restaurants are better than others, but it is impossible to get as good as a meal in a restaurant as one can get for the same expense in a private house. No doubt hotels and restaurants must exist, but there is no need that they should enslave hundreds of people. What makes the work in them is not the essentials, it is the shams that are supposed to represent luxury. Smartness, as it is called, means, in effect, merely that the staff work more and the customers pay more. No one benefits except the proprietor, who will presently buy himself a striped villa at Deauville. Essentially, a smart hotel is a place where a hundred people toil like devils in order that two hundred may pay through the nose for things they do not really want. If the nonsense were cut out of hotels and restaurants, and the work done with simple efficiency, plongeurs might work six or eight hours a day instead of ten or fifteen. Suppose it is granted that a plongeur's work is more or less useless. Then the question follows, why does anyone want him to go on working? I am trying to go beyond the immediate economic cause, and to consider what pleasure it can give anyone to think of men swabbing dishes for life. For there is no doubt that people, comfortably situated people, do find a pleasure in such thoughts. A slave, Marcus Cato said, should be working when he is not sleeping. It does not matter whether his work is needed or not, he must work, because work in itself is good. For slaves, at least. This sentiment still survives, and it has piled up mountains of useless drudgery. I believe that this instinct to perpetuate useless work is, at bottom, simply fear of the mob. The mob, the thought runs are such low animals that they would be dangerous if they had leisure. It is safer to keep them too busy to think. A rich man, who happens to be intellectually honest, if he is questioned about the improvement of working conditions, usually says something like this. We know that poverty is unpleasant. In fact, since it is so remote, we rather enjoy harrowing ourselves with the thought of its unpleasantness. But don't expect us to do anything about it. We are sorry for you lower classes, just as we are sorry for a cat with the mange. But we will fight like devils against any improvement of your condition. We feel that you are much safer as you are. The present state of affairs suits us and we are not going to take the risk of setting you free, even by an extra hour a day, 
So, dear brothers, since evidently you must sweat to pay for our trips to Italy, sweat and be damned to you. This is particularly the attitude of intelligent, cultivated people. One can read the substance of it in a hundred essays. Very few cultivated people have less than, say, 400 pounds a year. And naturally, they side with the rich, because they imagine that any liberty conceded to the poor is a threat to their own liberty. Foreseeing some dismal Marxian utopia as the alternative, the educated man prefers to keep things as they are. Possibly he does not like his fellow rich very much, but he supposes that even the vulgarest of them are less inimical to his pleasures, more his kind of people, than the poor, and that he had better stand by them. It is this fear of a supposedly dangerous mob that makes nearly all intelligent people conservative in their opinions. Fear of the mob is a superstitious fear. It is based on the idea that there is some mysterious fundamental difference between rich and poor, as though they were two different races, like Negroes and white men. But in reality, there is no such difference. The mass of the rich and poor are differentiated by their incomes and nothing else, and the average millionaire is only the average dishwasher dressed in a new suit. Change places, and handy-dandy, which is the justice, which is the thief. Everyone who has mixed on equal terms with the poor knows this quite well. But the trouble is that intelligent, cultivated people, the very people who might be expected to have liberal opinions, never do mix with the poor. For what do the majority of educated people know about poverty? In my copy of Villain's Poems, the editor has actually thought it necessary to explain the line in Ne peine voyant cœur fenestres by a footnote. So remote is even hunger from the educated man's experience. From this ignorance, a superstitious fear of the mob results quite naturally. The educated man pictures a horde of submen wanting only a day's liberty to loot his house, burn his books, and set him to work minding a machine or sweeping out a lavatory. Anything, he thinks, any injustice sooner than let that mob loose. He does not see that since there is no difference between the mass of rich and poor, there is no question of setting the mob loose. The mob is in fact loose now, and in the shape of rich men, is using its power to set up enormous treadmills of boredom, such as smart hotels. To sum up, a plongeur is a slave, and a wasted slave, doing stupid and largely unnecessary work. He has kept at work, ultimately, because of a vague feeling that he would be dangerous if he had leisure. And educated people, who should be on his side, acquiesce in the process because they know nothing about him and consequently are afraid of him. I say this of the plongeur because it is his case I have been considering. It would apply equally to numberless other types of worker. These are only my own ideas about the basic facts of a plongeur's life made without reference to immediate economic questions, and no doubt largely platitudes. I present them as a sample of the thoughts that are put into one's head by working in a hotel.